My name is James. My commute to work isn't too bad, thanks in large part to the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act. It definitely takes a lot of effort. The hardest part is getting in and out of the car. I'm an animator and editor at the World Bank. We produce videos about people all over the world who are lifting themselves out of poverty. From my edit suite, I get to watch footage from around the world. And in the back of my head, I've been thinking, how do the world's poorest people with disabilities, say, people in wheelchairs like me, manage to live and work? These are countries struggling to provide even basic services, like roads, let alone ramps. So in the studio, I pack up some gear with my awesome colleague, Peter. We're headed for an epic adventure. Here, we are boarding the plane. And here is what it looks like in my head. Animation, it's what I do. James, hold on. Wait, no, help. We fly from Washington, D.C. to Kingston, Jamaica, a country I've never visited. Oh God, I'm slipping. Most people think beaches, palm trees, drinks with rum. But Jamaica is also an energetic country of 2.7 million people. And unfortunately, it has one of the slowest growing economies in the developing world. An estimated 15% of Jamaicans live with some sort of disability. That includes deafness, blindness, mental issues, and physical disabilities. But Jamaica is stepping up to the plate. With support from the World Bank, they passed a Disability Act in 2014 to promote job training and accessibility for all. My plan is to hang out with Patrick. He received a grant to train as an electric wheelchair mechanic and start a business outside of Kingston. Luckily, we find a van to get there. Our driver, Derek, says it's the only one for hire in Jamaica that's equipped for wheelchairs. And with a little robotic help, Patrick and I are face to face. Patrick. Hi, James. Nice to meet you, finally. Greetings. Indeed. Oh, brother. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. He shows me around his shop he designed and built. Oh, this is it. This is the shop. Yeah, so you got a whole warehouse going here. Yeah. And we talk nonstop for hours about our work and our lives and the usual stuff. Patrick is a part-time photographer. You got a bunch of girls, too. Yeah. When we did the party, we realized that the girls, them, them wish them could have a photograph, man. Right? So we get myself a camera. I start take picture and dance and when we look. You know, so we just find it as a new job. We also talk about our injuries. We have T4. Ah, you're T4, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm above that, I'm T2. That's wheelchair code. Counting from the top, humans have seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, and another five sacral where our tails used to be. Patrick suffered a gunshot wound 22 years ago and was injured right about here. For me, a snowboarding accident 16 years ago crushed a couple of vertebrae here, higher up. So Patrick has more use of his upper body than I have of mine. That's the difference. The similarities are mental. We both have a drive to do something productive, basically to earn a living, preferably doing something we enjoy. The, the first thing that I thought of was like, oh God, like I'm not gonna be able to do anything. But then like, I was like, wait a minute, I can sit in front of a computer. And so instantly I was like, I'm trying to learn as much as I could. And then the brain started to click more to what you want to do. Yeah. But as we talk, I'm wondering, it's great to want a job, but how easy is it to work in a developing country when you're in a chair? So fast forward to the next day, and I'm about to find out. This is a market in central Kingston. 
We travel just a few blocks, but it takes forever. My eyes are glued to my footplate. I don't want it to get stuck and flip me over. Peter has to help me out. It's exhausting and unbelievably hot. Because of my injury, I don't sweat, and I have to keep pounding water so I don't overheat in the sun. This is tiring. I'm, it is not easy to get around. It's, you have to be paying attention all the time. It's all different, so like you'll do one curb cut and, and make it, but then the next one will be different, so then you gotta figure out what to do. A disabled Jamaican named Marlon was killed by a bus in the same area the previous year. I've seen the photo of his crushed wheelchair. Since sidewalks aren't a good fit, we're forced to share the road with traffic. Cars fly by. Jamaicans drive on the left, and my American brain is very confused when traffic comes from the other way. I'm thinking of Marlon a lot right now. All to buy some food for dinner. Can I buy three onions? Add. Please. And I just saw those hot peppers too. So yeah, mobility in Jamaica is a big problem. So how do people get to work? Patrick says most buses are designed to be wheelchair friendly, but the accessible sections have been crammed with extra seats. So public transportation isn't an option. If you're wealthy enough to have a car, parking is an issue. And even if you can get transport to your workplace, you face curbs and stairs and few ramps. The Jamaican Disability Act will change that, but it will take time. Old buildings will be converted and new buildings will be accessible. It's slow, but hey, it's progress. The World Bank funded Abilities Foundation is also providing training to mentally and physically disabled Jamaicans. These men are learning carpentry. The foundation also teaches furniture making, landscaping, and sewing. Meet Therese. She studied computer skills here, and now she's an assistant instructor. I think she's inspiring because she wants to give back to the community. I feel very fortunate because it's good when you can offer back to your own community. And when I said my own community, I'm talking about the disabled community. And Patrick, he feels that way too, about giving back. It seems like he knows everybody in Jamaica, disabled or not. He could have stayed in America, where he studied wheelchair repair, but he decided to return to Jamaica, even though it's harder to live here, because he wants to help his own people achieve a better quality of life, like he told me that first day. I showed him that, you know, if you go out there and beg, you can help yourself by doing a lot of things with your hand and your brain. And now, it's our last day. We've come to say goodbye to Patrick. He cooks up some fresh caught snapper and the vegetables I got at the market. I'm gonna miss this. I devoured dinner before heading out into the sunset. And it was at some point that evening, as we returned to the hotel, that it really hit me. When you're first injured, you think you'll be a burden to society. Whoa. You feel helpless when your body is no longer the way it used to be. But now, Therese and Patrick, not only are they not a burden, they're giving back to society. And that's what I strive for too. It's, and I think this comes out in, in Patrick's story, I'm far enough along into my disability that I can now turn and help other people. I have been able to heal and fix everything that was broken um, with myself um, when I was injured 16 years ago. And so now it's my turn to pick up the mantle and push as hard as I can. Because otherwise, everything that's happened before has been for nothing, and that, I think, cannot happen. Our environments are different, but we are united, not by our disability, but by our ability to reach out and change the world. The World Bank says we all benefit when everyone in society is given an opportunity to prosper. I've heard that. I'd even created videos about it before. 
But now, I feel it.